Welcome. I'd like to go ahead and get started. I know folks will likely be joining us over the next few minutes, but let's go ahead and get rolling. We're super excited to have you with us today, um, and we're excited to share with you a process that we started using this year at UC Santa Cruz in our teacher education program. Um, and um, just to give you a little bit of background before we get started, um, we only meet as a teacher supervisor team for two hours once a month. And so we always have this pull of having some administrative tasks that we need to complete. Um, but we um, really wanted to change our meetings so that we were spending more time collaborating and supporting each other's learning. And so one of the things that we've done is some book studies or bringing in some speakers. Um, did that a couple of times, some of the fellow faculty at UC Santa Cruz to talk about the work that they're doing. Um, but this year, um, one of our teacher supervisors, Johnny Wilson, whom I'm sure most of you have met in earlier sessions, um, suggested that we might use his lesson study protocol. Um, but instead of the focus being students talking about their teaching, the focus being supervisors talking about some aspect of their practice. And with that very brief introduction, I'd like to introduce my two colleagues. Um, one teacher supervisor and lecturer, Johnny Wilson, if you could just give a wave. And then my other colleague with us is Jennifer Jones Hins, who is also a teacher supervisor of multiple subjects, English and social sciences. So thank you for joining us today. And I'm gonna turn it over. Let me give you a slight overview of what we have in mind today. Um, we're going to be sharing with you the process that we use, um, and um, we were pretty excited about it. But we're going to talk about it from three different perspectives. First, Johnny's going to go over the actual protocol that he developed, and then we're going to talk about the process that we use first from the perspective of supervisors participating in a conversation about a colleague's proposed um, problem of practice is what we've been the term that we've been using. They bring a problem that they've encountered in their teacher supervision and they share it with the group and then we all get a chance to talk about it. So we're going to talk about it first from the perspective of folks who are engaging in conversations about a problem of practice from a peer. And then we're going to talk about it from the perspective of teacher supervisors who themselves have brought a problem of their of their own practice to share with their colleagues. And then finally, we're gonna let Johnny talk about the facilitation of this. He always facilitates these and he's gonna share with us some of his goals for facilitating these conversations. And finally, we thought we would go ahead and model it where we as a group could be, um, a, um, we could pretend that we're a team of supervisors and Jennifer has graciously agreed to share with us a real live problem that she's encountered in her supervision. And then we can engage in the process together. So that's our plan for the day. And what I'd like to do for starters is turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Johnny Wilson, and he's gonna share with us the protocol that he developed. Thank you all for being here. I'm gonna share a screen with you. Um, so we call it lesson study, and lesson study comes from Japanese um, methods of improving constant improvement, especially in mathematics education. Lesson study cycle, usually study plan, teach and observe, debrief, revise, reteach, reflect, and report. Um, but the goals for lesson study are always just about constant improvement and collegiality, collegial conversation. So that's the essential thing we're working towards is a collegial constant conversation about our about our practice in terms of problems of practice so i worked with i do lesson study with my students i shared some of that today um, my materials will be available to people as they need we use a supervision journal and we use some form of that in order in to do our um, lesson study work with our peers so um we wrestled with the kinds of knowledge that we might have in terms of teaching, the what of teacher education. And there's so many things for us to consider. And we think lesson study is a good way to go about this. And so here's the frame for our lesson study. Um, so meet as a colleague of ours. Our framework is there's a presentation of a case and Jennifer will be doing this in a little bit. Um, and that case will talk about as she shares her case, she will be sharing what's working, questions and considerations that go along. And that follows with peer contributions and then reflections on contributions and suggestions for directions. So this is important because we're gonna ask you 
to think about these for yourself as well. The presenter of the case should tell the story of the event and provide artifacts if available. The peers, that's all of us, are to listen well, connect the case to teach of teaching to own experience, ask questions to clarify or deepen consideration of the case, and offer suggestions or directions during reflection. And the moderator, I've always been the moderator, I'll be the moderator today, I'm lis listening. I'm listening really well, and I'm going to be taking notes. And those notes will come up at the end of the deep uh, of some of the discussion as a way of drawing to a close or summing up what things we've learned together from the case of teaching. And I'm just going to go briefly. This is these are example cases. Samita so brought in this case about two people struggling relationship with peers. Another Jennifer, a case about a student. Um, went through high school and undergrad. Each of these is cases, and um, we've just been collecting them over this past year, cases of teaching, and these are our working documents, and we're going to be doing one of these as well for ourselves. So I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer, who's going to share with us experiences of being a part of, of this process. I believe that's what's next. Yeah, well, one of the things that um, I was asked to talk about was when engaging in conversations about a problem of practice brought to me by a colleague um, to describe what about the process is beneficial to me personally. And I have to say that, um, you know, for working so closely and so um, enjoying all of the collegiality we have, um, sometimes it can feel kind of isolating. Everybody is so busy and running from place to place. And sometimes we're having just brief conversations with each other and being able to come together and be with each other. And I will tell you that this, I didn't realize this um, at the beginning, but um, this process really requires a lot of vulnerability. We have a lot of trust with each other. We have a great relationship. And seeing my colleagues be vulnerable about situations that they're going through, they're usually very similar to something I've been working through or something that has been on my mind. And it's so nice to be able to come together. Um, I enjoy seeing how people are working through the issues. Um, what happens during this process is we are working together to brainstorm in the process of growth that is taking place. And I feel like I take away just as much um, as the presenter, if not, I always feel like I gain so much just being a participant in the process because there's always things that I can use to help myself the, the student teachers I work with and ultimately the students grow as well. And so being um, a participant has been incredibly rewarding for me. Thank you, Jennifer. I'll go ahead and share my experience also being a participant in the conversation of problems that others have brought and then Johnny can share that as well. So for me, um, what's really exciting about this process is that somebody poses a problem and the, and the strategies that they've tried to rectify their issue. Um, and this has something to do with teacher supervision. So this is the supervisor working with a student teacher to help the student teacher grow. And what I, what absolutely tickles me about this is that there, it, this ignites an explosion of creativity, an explosion of um, sharing of ideas. Um, people are so thoughtful. Um, and what ends up coming out in these conversations, not only what the problem is, what the individual has attempted so far, but people are sharing their own strategies, similar situations they've had themselves, how they've dealt with it, whether it's been successful or not. Um, but also what comes out in this conversation is people are able to open up and talk about what their values are as a teacher supervisor, what they're really trying to accomplish in their supervision. Um, they talk about what their priorities are, things that they focus on. It gets very explicit very quickly. Um, and um, then also we actually get down to the details of uh, sharing specific questions that supervisors frequently use in supporting the development of teacher of student teachers. So it's been really exciting for me as um, basically kind of on the side because I'm not a teacher supervisor, but I'm at these meetings and we just see this as a way to dedicate a good chunk 
of our two hour meeting block to actual sharing practices with one another. And it's, it's just been delightful. And um, as Jennifer said, um, people really getting to be vulnerable and open up with one another, but it's a great learning opportunity. So Johnny, if you can share a little bit about what you get out of it as somebody um, who gets to sit in on conversations about others' problems that they're posing. So I'm often the moderator, so I'm the one who takes notes along the way, but that means I get to hear what connects people to one another or themes that come up across our shared practices of supervision. What kinds of things do we all have something going on that's similar to each other? I wanted to, um, I wanted to make a connection to this morning's talk too, Dr. Acosta. Um, and I shared this with in my presentation earlier this morning too, this notion of familia or family, because it really is a case of, we all sit around a table and we're talking about the work we do in a way that's very much egalitarian, democratic, in support of one another, in the ways that Dr. Acosta was talking about. It's a way of, of thinking about supervision as not just you know, what the state tells us we should do, but how we come together at a table and say, well, what do we do as professionals? How do we support each other? How do we work this through as a family? So I really appreciated that from this talk this morning. Um, I think we're going to start with a, Celeste, are we going on to a case of teaching? Not quite yet. What I was hoping we could do, Johnny, is if you could share the actual components of the protocol, just the Thank empty you. form. I put the link over in the chat. Um, kind of walk through the process, uh, uh, how we structure it, and, and share your screen. And then after that, I'd like um, Jennifer and you both to share your experience when you brought what you got out of it when you brought a problem of practice to the group. Thank you for keeping us sailing straight, Celeste. <laughs> So um, I'm sharing screen, and this is the protocol that we use, and I'll talk about the pieces of it so we can understand them better. As I said before, um, there's gonna be a presenter, gonna present a case. They'll start with what is working. We like to ground things in the positive. Um, we don't just come to it and start complaining about things. We like to think about what is working well in our practice because we want to get better at things, not just complain about things. The important thing is that um, questions are set out and considerations are set out that we all have to work through. It's not a done deal. And the offerings made by the presenter, it's understood that their peers are there to help and support. After the question or consideration has been set out, then peers contribute. And during that time, I will be taking notes along the way because we'll come back and reflect on those notes as well. So peer contributions. Um, and that reflection, sometimes spurs further conversation and sets out sometimes for us moves we might make as supervisors to improve our practice. Roles, the presenter of the case should tell the story of the event and provide artifacts if available. Um, I know for me in recent years, the notion of story as a means to learn, as a, me as a mechanism to learn matters a whole lot. So these, these cases really are stories of teaching. We can learn so much from them. And peers are to listen well, but also to connect the case of teaching to their own experience, asking questions along the way to deepen the consideration of the case and to offer suggestions or directions during the reflection. So um, the rest of us aren't passive. We're actively engaged, present, trying to make sense of the case for the presenter, but also making sense of the case for ourselves because we share in practice. And as I said, the moderator keeps notes, gives direction to reflection. Now, this is a protocol, and we'll share this with you as well if you're interested in doing such work. So the case of teaching, this is something set out, and Jennifer's going to be sharing one with us in a little bit. And we frame them around TPEs, things that matter in our teaching. Again, what is working is shared next. The questions, considerations, and concerns follows and then peer contributions. And often, um, as I shared in my presentation earlier, often peer contributions start with something positive, something that was working well. I appreciate that you did this. I've seen, I, I've done the same thing and I found it to be worthwhile. And then people will follow, often follow with, I wonder about, or have you tried ways to move us all forward? And then in the closing conversation, we write down reflections, selections, suggestions for direction. So that's the protocol that we use in our lesson study work with our peers. 
Awesome, great orientation, an overview, Johnny. Thank you so much. Um, so what I'd like to do now is invite first Jennifer and then Johnny to share with us a little bit about the experience that you had when you brought well, a case or a problem of practice to the group this year. We're a small team. We have eight supervisors, plus me, plus our analyst. We, so we get together and there's around 10 of us typically. Um, but um, so share with me a little bit about your experience. And I'm really curious, Jennifer, what you got out of it professionally, but also personally, and what it felt like when you brought a case to your peers. Yeah, absolutely. I will tell you that when I bring a case to my peers, I'm usually feeling stuck. And I kind of am starting to feel like I'm kind of banging my head and I want to get unstuck. And I've mentioned it to colleagues, but I don't feel like I've really um, allowed myself to give the space that I think I need. And um, I usually realize that when I'm talking to my husband a lot about what's going on, but that's when I need to stop and I need more than what's happening. And so how it affects me, it's, it's all of a sudden that this is impacting my personal life. You know, as teachers, sometimes we have difficulty, you know, letting separating our personal and our professional lives. And I feel like this provides me that opportunity. It really allows me the opportunity to say, okay, I need more than what's happening right here. And it provides me an opportunity to step back from it. And with the protocol or with the, um, with the case of mentorship and the, and the teaching, just filling out those three sections is incredibly beneficial. I mean, Johnny, you said it, what is working? And so what it allows me to do is to step back and say, okay, what are all the things that are going well for this student teacher? But where am I getting stuck and what, what moves do I need to be able to see clear? And knowing that I'm going to get that, um, it is, it's almost like I can breathe, I can exhale and let go of what I've been carrying around. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, things I take away, I was just thinking about how we're all teacher educators and we all think about teachers learn and develop over time. And the irony of the case where as teacher educators, we don't put ourselves in the situations where we might learn and grow together the way we expect our student teachers to. So this is one of the things about this, this form of lesson study is that I'm a supervisor, I've supervised for a while, but I have so many things to learn still from peers and they have context experiences, knowledge that I don't have. And I've, we're purposely putting ourselves around a table together to learn from one another. So supervisors as learners, supervisors as developing their own practice. It's something that's been a theme for CTERN for years is supervisors have work to do. What is that work and how do we learn to do it well? And this is the place, a space we've constructed for ourselves to do this well. So and I appreciate working with Jennifer and Sumita and my peers because they, they have knowledge I don't have. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I can't tell you how much I've learned from everyone when folks have brought these cases. It's been really wonderful. Um, Johnny, now I'm wondering if we could switch hats now and if you could share with us when you facilitate and take notes, can you share with us what's going on in your head? What are you looking for? What are you hoping to achieve? And what are you, I know you are looking ahead toward the lower um, entries in the, in the protocol. And I'm wondering, you know, what you're thinking and how you're strategizing toward that. Well, I'm purposely paying attention to a few things. One is I want to capture strengths. And so, and this is and when I do similar work with student teachers, they are very self-effacing. They don't necessarily bring up the things that are going well. So I'm always looking for what peers might say or the, or the little comment of some bit of joy in the supervision, something that was a surprise, something that gave some worth to the supervisor and making sure that that's noted because I think we always have to work from our strengths and not just think about how many things don't work for us and whatever we're doing. I'm also looking for things that are themes across um, our supervision. There's some things about, um, we often have timid student teachers, ones who are a little bit shy to do things, to step into a role. What does it mean to take risks? How do we work with student teachers to say, take that next baby step, take that next little bit to move forward the kinds of things that come up as themes across our supervision for all of us. Um, but then there's other things that come up in 
our conversations which sometimes are just innovative practices. Why don't we try this? And sometimes we co-construct those as well. Things that say, you know, we, the taken for granted ways we go about supervision, we can question together. And so when I'm taking notes, it might be something I bring up later. Well, what, how can we think about this differently? What might we do to develop in our practice in a way that's different than what we've always done that doesn't seem to do the work we needed to do? So um, I'm kind of the catch-all. I'm kind of the one who's sitting and, and trying to do the meta-thinking while all the good practical talk is happening along the way too. Thank you, Celeste. Awesome, thank you so much. I was trying to respond over in the chat to some of the questions that have been coming up and I, I hope I answered the questions. Okay, what we'd like to do now, just so that we're um, clear about what we do is we're gonna model the process for you. But what we'd like to do is invite all of you to be part of our supervisor team. So we're all teacher supervisors. One of our colleagues is going to bring to us a case or a problem of practice, something that she has been struggling with or challenged with, or just really wants input um, from her colleagues uh, about. Johnny is going to um, take notes and we'll get to see how he's taking notes. Um, so who would like to share screen? Is that going to be you, Jennifer, or you, Johnny? I could share the screen. Okay, and then, and this is, um, I think Jennifer sent the link where she had already started typing in her 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 stuff yeah okay very good all right take it away all right I'm gonna you'll see up here the framework and the roles and everything and then you'll see kind of what I have filled out prior to coming into session and so the way I would start is we would all have the opportunity to see this for the first time and I would talk through what's going on so Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to talk about a case of mentorship. The TPEs that I really want to focus on are TPE 1.5, Promoting Critical Thinking, Inquiry, Problem Solving, Reflection, and TPE 4.7, which is promoting a range of communication and activity modes. So I have a student teacher that I'm working with who is in a secondary classroom and relies on direct instruction. And so what I mean by that is that the format is lecture. So the student teacher definitely has slides that are going on. So there is vocabulary, there is visuals, there is information that is on the slides. Um, but the student, and normally what's going on like throughout the entire lesson is that students are copying kind of bolded notes in a, into a graphic organizer that the student teacher provides that is divided into sections based on the notes, but it's almost like just copying down the information like here's a slide with lots of things going on, you know, make sure you get the most important information. Here's what it is because it's been bolded for you. And so that's pretty much what's been going on. Um, the observations have pretty much been the same without variation, even with feedback that critical thinking and engagement need to be in the lesson. So I'm feeling stuck about this right now. What is working is that the student teacher clearly has is very comfortable not only in the content and the standards, like great understanding and knowledge of what, what the content is. And I mean, is able to talk about it for, all, for the entire class. Um, the student teacher creates connections for the students. So the, the student teacher is thinking about when putting the slideshow together for the students, like here are ways that the student teacher is thinking about connections for the students. So that is something that's working. The students are engaged. I, I will say that, that they are filling out the graphic organizer. Um, you know, the, I will say that the, the student teacher does walk around, that the students are engaged in the content when I am in there. So I'm not seeing, everybody seems to be on task. So, and the student teacher is asking questions and the students are respond, responding. So they're, they're, there is, there is quite a bit that's working. But in regards to my questions and considerations and concerns, um, the, while the students are engaged and the student teacher is providing connections and asking questions, they're very teacher driven. And what I see is, is that the, the 
student teacher will ask a question, the student responds, the teacher will ask another question, the student will respond, or it's a choral response. And the information is definitely right on the slide. So I'm, um, so that's, that's been what's happening. And um, even though we have had multiple conversations, the student teacher continues to justify the decisions that there's too much content to cover, there's not enough time. The students say they really like the format, they feel comfortable, they appreciate all of this. And so while I've been trying to talk about ways to make the slides more interactive or to include some um, like situations for the students, um, I'm feeling stuck right now. And so my question is, what moves might I make to help this student teacher move forward to engage students in critical thinking and promote a range of communication? And I guess what I mean by a range of communication is I would like students talking to each other as opposed to just the back and forth between the student and the student teacher. I want more. I want more in regards to communication and more in regards to critical thinking. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, Jennifer. So at this point, we would like to invite um, everyone in this session, if you're interested, to please, um, uh, please join us in this conversation to support Jennifer, our colleague, who's brought this problem of practice, this case to share with us of um, feeling a little stuck with this particular student who um, wants, it's, he's providing a very teacher-centered um, uh, uh, pedagogical practice for his students. And Jennifer would really like to see him shift to, to um, engaging students more intellectually, um, higher order thinking, but also engaging them more so that they are um, having um, a, a higher level of engagement with the experience. Um, and so um, what I was thinking that we could do is, I mean, folks could raise their hand um, or feel free to add something to the chat, but I would, we'd really love to hear from you. So if you have ideas, what we've put here in the green bar is that what would be appropriate to share with any similar challenges that you've had with your student teachers um, or any suggestions that you have for Jennifer, Jennifer, things that you have tried that have been successful with your students when you want to move them away from a very teacher-centered approach to their practice. May I? Yes, please. Okay. <clears throat> um, I have had this same thing happen numerous times. Um, I've been, you know, supervising for 10 years. Well, this will be my 10th year of supervising student teachers. And then during my teaching career, I had almost 20 student teachers from Cal State Long Beach and UCI and, and Fullerton. Anyway, um, what I said to them is that here are your TPEs and your TPAs, and I want to see all of them in practice. Critical thinking is critical, and I would suggest you consider in every lesson, take yourself off stage, put your students on stage. You wanna make your students active learners, not passive. So if you have a lesson with slides and so on and so forth, wonderful. Divide it up divided up into your into groups of your students, give them the responsibility of certain topics, let them present to the rest of class. Let your students become experts in parts of the lessons. Do that in a gentle way at the beginning. And then as time goes on, as weeks pass, give a particular open-ended question for a group to do the research, to put together their own slides and presentation and do the teaching. Study after study after study has shown us that if you put your students in a teaching frame where they're actually doing the teaching, they're learning 100% more than if they're just passively listening. Enough said. 
Thank you so much, Michael. That was very helpful. Um, and um, I'm super excited that we have a few others who have some ideas to help Jennifer out, um, share their expertise. First, we'll hear from Walt and then Evelyn, and then I'll go down the list of those who have raised their hands. Thank you very much. Um, in response to the question of the teacher-centered instruction challenge, um, I'd like to present everyone with this book, um, Total Participation. It's a fantastic book that addresses the issue of teacher-centered instruction in a way that will involve not only a few extra students, three or four who raise their hand quickly and get it called on, but all students. So an example from this book would be something that's called the wave, where students, there's four um, aspects to the wave. So the wave would be where the teacher is lecturing, as the beginning of this lesson says. And each student then has to discern within their own mind what is being said without benefit of any um, uh, coupling with other people. So then they start with this background knowledge that they have um, assimilated from the instruction. Now, the next step would be they're put into pairs where they discuss with one other person what they've thought of that um, concept. It's less threatening than going immediately into a group of four and discussing. So now they've had the opportunity to discern the idea or topic individually on their own and then share it with another person and bounce ideas off of one another. Third step, they join into a group of four. Now they've had the background of individual processing, sharing with someone else. Now they're in a group of four and they feel more free, studies have shown, to discuss openly, whereas prior to that, if they'd gone from individual thinking to group discussion, they may not. So now they're in a group of four and they're freely discussing among four people the um, concept that was being presented. Step four, they join back into the regular class discussion and now we have a grand conversation um, crossing as many people as possible. So that's just one idea from this book. Uh, many others are there. So what we're trying to get away from is what I like to call I-R-E where traditional hundreds of years teaching would be where the teacher lectures and then initiates, that's the I, a question. Three or four students raise their hand, that's the R, where they respond, the R. And then the teacher for the E section would be evaluating that one answer and then going on to a second, then a third, then a fourth. The problem is, of course, the rest of the class is not involved in many kids who never participate because they're either nervous, they're slow processors, they're EL English learners, learners. they never get to take part. So this wave idea um, at, plays on the um, pair share, um, turn and partner idea into gradually leading a person into a more uh, meaningful discussion based on background information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walt. I just bought the book. It's so exciting. Um, let's hear from Evelyn and then Lisa. Hi. Um, thank you for sharing that problem of practice, Jennifer. I think we all on this panel or in the, in the session can relate to your dilemma of practice. Um, as you were sharing, there are a couple of things that came to my mind. One, what is the teacher's agency in that classroom? I'm wondering like, how much of the mentor teacher is allowing the student teacher to be able to do things that are creative or is the mentor or is the student teacher kind of having to subscribe to the pedagogy and the methodologies that um, the mentor teacher is asking the student teacher to to engage in and if there's a lack of agency our role is to help um, remove some of those barriers and to you know to tackle that obstacle to allow the student teacher to be able to throw in some of these, you know, pure collaborative kind of coursework. Um, because if that, that's something that's not uh, where that the student teacher is not able to do, that's a conversation with the mentor teacher as well. Um, the second thing that I, I wonder about is um, how much of the student is bringing I'm sorry, is it a he? Uh, his own experiences from his from his student experience into the teaching experience. And um, and how much, yeah, how much is he reproducing what he knows and translating it into the classroom? And so there needs to be some kind of a mind shift 
um, as opposed to like immediately giving the student like a bunch of strategies that they can try. Um, it's it's a they don't know what they don't know. So there needs to be a whole lot of modeling in terms of, OK, there's a different way to do this lesson as opposed to just direct teaching. Um, and so we scaffold, we, you know, we, we start from where they are. And I do like how this protocol talks about the strength. So there are strengths to the student teaching. Um, and how do we build upon that strength so that they can, be, they can start to deconstruct and tear down that, like this singular, you know, uh, model of teacher lecturing into a more collaborative model. So yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot to be uh, there. There's a lot of conversation to be had with the student. Thank you so much, Evelyn. So insightful. Really appreciate that. How about Lisa? Then Pete. Hi. Thank you. Everything that was said prior. <laughs> Such a delight to hear everybody's expertise. What it made me wonder about was the conversation we had at the beginning of the semester framing the goals for the teacher, the student teacher, meaning is there a space here to come back to, oh, okay, well, if we've established that these other forms of learning are important, if it's not happening here, where are you seeing it in your work? So helping them identify the spaces where they've already established what they wanna do, they now have the lesson and they're seeing that it's not landing on that list. And maybe that begins a conversation that goes back to Evelyn's paragraph. <laughs> awesome. Thank does you. That, does, okay, thanks. Thanks. How about Pete and then Barbara? Yes, thank you. I, I really did want to build upon what Evelyn was talking about, that mindset, and also building upon the strengths of the candidate. So to make this brief, I would really try to speak to this candidate's uh, repertoire of teaching practices um, as a way to broaden them and impress upon them that they could get practice in some skills that might better serve them in their first year teaching. For example, uh, they end up, if they're at the secondary level, they're on a block schedule where they're going to be managing time and instruction differently if right now they're on a traditional schedule. So I would encourage that as a way to address their concerns about covering instructional material um, at a fast pace as far as pacing goes. Um, I've seen in the chat the emphasis on Bloom's taxonomy, and, and I'd also build upon the fact that this, this banking model using Ferry and pedagogy about delivering the content to the students is, is limited as far as it's not challenging uh, our students and those higher order Bloom's taxonomy skills like application. Um, and, and then I would also try to make it as practical, for example, if I bring in EdTPA in my limited role as uh, a supervisor and point out that they're for EdTPA, they're going to be capturing how they're uh, intellectually challenging their their students and their delivery of instruction uh, is limited in how that can be addressed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pete, for your insights. Very valuable. Let's hear from Barbara, then Christina, and finally Edwina. Okay. Well, my thoughts were that um, some when one said at supervising for 10 years, I'm going into my 17th. And so lots of changes from when I left the classroom, what I've seen, but taking kind of the strengths and what this student teacher was doing, my question kind of is when they are asking questions, are they getting asking questions to help fill in where the blanks are? Or are they more of a checking kind of for the understanding of what has been put there? Um, and so, kind of an intermediate would be to take still whatever their study guide they're using or their guided notes and get input before they fill anything in or show it and have the students write those down and then go to what kind of have them discuss in pairs or groups to agree on something 
and then come together as a class to come up with the more formal word that should go there or definition. Thank you, Barbara, for your insights. Very much appreciate it. Um, Christina and then Edwina, and then we can hear from Johnny as facilitator, and then we actually get to hear from Jennifer, how she actually tackled this problem. Great, thank you. Um, well, when you were talking about questioning, Barbara, and that's one of the biggest challenges for our student teachers is understanding how to build a question that works for the purpose of meeting the objective and guiding the students to understanding. And um, so possibly practicing um, how, you know, model how to teach something to our student teachers uh, using only questioning strategies with no lecture and having them come to realization that they can now, they've now met the objective of that particular short little lesson you can do. Um, the other one was, um, I think it was Evelyn was talking about where are they coming from with their um, previous experience of how they learned in school and to have that conversation with them to identify what their teachers did and how is that going to be different now uh, based on what's expected with the TPEs, the TPAs, and Fresno State does a little different. Um, and then... Um, my biggest problem with student teachers for me, one of mine, one, is um, I'll, how will you meet the objective? Uh, what is it? Did you meet the objective? Did what you did? Do you, how can you prove to me that those students got it? And so that is, um, for me, been a huge challenge. I would like to make that as one of our things to do. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, so those are just uh, the, the, the things that, that I wanted to bring up and the ways that I've tried to address this. But I've only done this a year, you guys. So you're all the pros and I'm trying to learn. <laughs> so we appreciate you your insights, Christina. Very, very helpful. And finally, Edwina, then I'm going to turn it over to Johnny to complete his facilitation. And then we'll, I'd like to hear from Jennifer. Okay. Um, I don't know where this fits in, but I just wanted to say one of the things that I use, and it might work for situations that we're uh, talking about, is reflective questioning. So I, uh, it's always good to have a good set of reflective questionings. And I, I either ask the student teachers to bring them when they come into the, like, PLC or, uh, and, or, or I he asked them to email some areas of uh, concern or different things like that. And I already have the reflective questions so they can help like guide you through like the description and then get, they get an opportunity to get filling in there and analysis and evaluation and everything. And I think it's like in a, a low effective filter uh, type of way when you do it like that. And there's like a, a variety or a range of types of questions, reflective questions that you use, you know, to be able to pull out kind of like what you want, that type of thing. So I don't know, just, I don't know, just uh, reflective questioning is just a really big thing. And then I do want to put, I'm trying to grab it real quick, the name of a great book on questioning strategies, which is something that I always try to model and then, uh, and then talk about how I've modeled it and uh, also talk about how it's useful to, for the classroom environment as well. And that's it. Fabulous, thank you so much. Johnny, take it away. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, I'm, I'm gonna put it out there to you. Just uh, take a moment. What, well, you saw me write in my notes, you heard all the conversations. What uh, two or three themes that came up during this that maybe some of you caught on to that you was was offered by peers maybe you want to put those in chat because i have in mind a couple of things already but if you want to put in chat just right now some something that came up from these comments that are general thoughts about how to work with the student and go ahead put some of those in the chat and then i'm going to talk through this myself so lisa's offered the idea of student teachers beliefs views about teaching and their role. That was a theme that came up because um, more than one person said, are they locating their teaching in the teaching that they had as a child or in a high school? And is, are they replicating something that they had? That's what's familiar to them. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are saying, Rebecca's also saying, start with what the candidate is. 
So that came up a couple of folks said, start with their abilities. What kinds of things, um, this was Pete said, start speak to the candidate's repertoire of teaching practices. So not making what the, not making the experience of the candidate a problem, but a resource and to, something to work from. Um, multiple resources for our student teachers to share, share personal stories that drive their ideas home. Okay, I'm gonna offer a few things, let me see. Um, okay, that, that was another one that came up for me as a theme. This one, I think Catherine's saying something about own video and track the number and types of questions they ask. Um, this was also suggested by Edwina, which is ask the student teacher to, to did they meet the goals of the lesson? Or was this, um, Christina maybe also asked this, or Christina asked this, what was it that you hoped from this lesson? Tell us what you happened in this lesson. Did you meet those goals? And so that kind of self-reflection, self-assessment on the lesson as well. So I'm going to talk through a few things that came up for me, um, starting off with um, locating it in a common expectation. So we start with Michael, this idea that we have expectations for our teaching and that we've named them. Our named expectation for teaching is that student teachers should be asked to think deeply about things. We have an expectation for critical thinking. It came up across. How do we present this to the student teacher? So it's like, you're doing a lot of good things, but is it just about filling out forms? What about this critical thinking? Where is that located in your teaching? Um, Walt offered this great book, some particular strategies, ways to move towards richer involvement by the students, not just will it happen or accidentally happen? What are some particular moves? And this is what um, the, that Jennifer set out before. She wanted moves. What moves do I give my student teacher? Well, a move might be, here's three steps you might move towards greater involvement. You could start with some dispense giving knowledge, but then you need to work with students in pairs and then in groups of four and then bring them back to whole group discussions. That's a particular supervisor move, something that might be um, suggested to the student teacher. And then um, this is Evelyn's contributions. Um, we, every student teacher, what happens for student teachers isn't just about them for me. For me, it's also about the context they're in and what shapes their practice in practicum is what's offered to them. So we need to keep that in mind. And Evelyn's suggestion was, what's the context? How is, how is the context shaping how this student teacher is going about things? And then um, the, the next one was, and I appreciated this one very much from Lisa, just that what are the common expectations for the practicum? Is it about getting things done or is it about really moving kids thinking? And how is that always a part of seminar and the kinds of ways we talk to our student teachers? Again, Pete and repertoire of practices. Um, and also again, for me, when I think about this, giving attention to context for the student teacher as well. How is your practice right now being shaped by your cooperating teacher? How is it shaped by the circumstances, the institution, the schedules and such? And then the idea of agency, what can you do within those spaces for your own teaching? That was a, um, maybe there was Evelyn, other folks were talking about student teachers agency. Um, and then this is the last one I'm gonna offer. A theme that came up was about questioning and how to address questioning in seminar with student teachers, but also getting very practical, going back mm -hmm. to teacher moves or supervisor mm -hmm. moves. What kinds of questions do we offer our student teachers as models for questioning? And the one I really appreciated, Edwina, was this notion of in the pre-conference, the, the talk we have before a student teacher shares their lesson with us, asking them what questions are you going to be asking your student teacher? I'm sorry asking the students to say, what are the questions you'll be asking that really push students thinking to the places you really want them to go? So questioning became a theme. So those are the things that came up for me and I appreciate so much the people, the offerings that were offered in the chat as well. So Jennifer, we've offered you lots to think about. Yeah, I'm overwhelmed by um, all of the great ideas that came about. And really what I felt that you all did was um, provide, I, I so appreciate you saying, you know, those of you who said, 
I've been there, I've seen this, you know, this isn't just you. I've also been stuck as well with this, um, with this particular um, type of situation. And what I loved about everything that I received was I was, you know, this is normally, I don't think we talked about this part of it, but usually the um, presenter is actually jotting down a bunch of notes as well. I do that even though Johnny records it, I'm also like trying to think through things or I don't know, it just, it just seems to happen. Maybe that's just me. Um, I felt like you all just provided me with opportunities about how to move forward. For this particular student, um, this student teacher was really, I think, it wasn't about the cooperating teacher, but I loved you bringing that up because that's also, I've seen that happen and that provided me a different way to think about it. But it almost felt like this is what this student teacher is, um, th their default, how they feel comfortable teaching, what they've seen. And so I really do need to figure out how to do that shift. And in the midst of that, I need to be going back to theory with that. Um, I have, I'm excited about the book, the techniques. I'm so excited about that. Um, the questions, I would love the book of questioning strategies or the questions that were, you know, any questions, I would love it. And then I also like the idea of thinking about how I may take some of this and not just utilize it when I'm working with the student teacher individually, but maybe some things that I could bring also into our um, into the class with the student, not just this student, but would help benefit other students and maybe that student hearing from others as well. But I feel like I got so many different ways to approach this situation. And I just am so thankful for that feedback about how to proceed forward. Hey, Jennifer, I want to thank you for making yourself vulnerable and sharing your little situation and Johnny for facilitating. Um, but I do want to pop out of it. We were role modeling what this would be like. Jennifer actually had this case, and I believe you ended with some success. So why don't you share with us what you did that resulted in your success and, and sort of um, as you dug down into the situation, what you learned and, and how you ended up achieving some success? I mean, I almost felt like you know, somewhat similar to this one, I felt like I had the confidence to move forward and to say, look, this is the theory behind it. These are the TPEs or what's, you know, the TPA is about as well. And, you know, really having that conversation about um, the importance of this and that whole idea that just because you've heard from a couple of students doesn't mean that everybody is understanding and how are you really um, assessing that as well. Um, I want to say that the student teacher went forward um, in regards to what was happening, but um, I love all of this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jennifer, I don't think you're, I, I just want to push you a little bit here because what I recall is um, Jennifer was thinking about the student's own zone of proximal development. And she really wanted the student to experience, the student teacher to experience some success. So she dug and um, what she ended up doing from my recollection, Jennifer, is you helped him plan a very detailed lesson with a very right. specific student engagement strategy, just so right. that he could have that light bulb go off right. of, wow, that was really successful, because she wasn't yeah. so sure that he was yet at the place where he could plan that and execute it well right. on his own. So she really supported him to till he had that first success, and I do yeah. think that was a turning point for that student, and realizing yes. that I think what she thought is that's probably where he's stuck is that he yeah. has not yet had a chance to experience success when right. students are leading the class. Um, right. 
Um, Johnny, any final thoughts on your role as facilitator here? It's like, and I just want to recap for everybody what we did. What we wanted to do is tell you about a process that we use among our supervisor team to support one another's growth and to really share the strategies and the insights that we all have individually. And then we modeled it for you. And as you can see, we got this wealth of resources and expertise and creativity. Um, it seemed like everybody had something to bring to this conversation. We really appreciate that. Um, but I want to know if there's any final comments from Johnny as facilitator or Jennifer as um, person who brought a case to the group. I'll start, Jennifer. That's okay. Yeah. Um, just, just bless you all for being so generous. All the good things you're thinking about <laughs> and that kind of you know, we need opportunities to have that kind of sharing. And so this is a structured way to do that, where we build collegiality, you build that table, like I was saying earlier, the notion of family, the things that might be said here that could, you know, we don't say in more formal settings, that really get to the really rich parts of our work. We all have experiences with student teachers who teach in ways we find funny and not quite sure about, and I might have a way of going about it. But look at all the different ways and wonderful ways of thinking about teaching and supervision that are available from our peers. So just so much appreciation. The last thing that we usually do, and I do this with my student teachers when I do this and study with them, is we do spend a couple minutes just thanking the person either in chat or in person for right. that piece of sharing your teaching because we all know how vulnerable we are when we do so. And that was also another piece that came up from the keynote this morning. But it's about where do, what places do we put ourselves and make ourselves a little bit vulnerable so we can learn things. And so I appreciate Jennifer for doing that for us today. Awesome. Was, oh, go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, I was just going to say that afterwards, I usually feel invigorated and ready to like go back into working with this student teacher, just feeling, yeah, invigorated and energized and ready to just take the ideas and move forward. Awesome. Um, well, thank you all for joining us today. We know folks need a lunch break, but we want to thank you for joining us. And if you would like to um, have a copy of our protocol, we put it in the shared folder. Um, and we thoroughly enjoyed having this opportunity to share with you today. So thank you so much, Johnny, for designing this process and bringing it to our team. And Jennifer, you're just awesome. I really appreciate you. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you. I gained so much from everyone. Thank you so much.